Yeah, um, good evening, um, the audience, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for, for coming tonight, for joining us. And this, um, this weather you never can predict if you have an empty room or a full room, but we have um, uh, air conditioned, so that's, that's, a, that's a plus. Um, and, and the plus is also that we uh, do this Simon Wiesenthal lecture again in a cooperation. And so I want to start um, my, 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 my introduction introductory words. I am Jochen Böhler. I'm the director of the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies with a big thank to the, to the French Cultural Institute in Vienna and to the embassy to, to be present here and to, to co uh, cooperate um, in, this, in, this, in this event. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure um, to, to introduce to you, if you don't know him yet, Thomas Chopin, a very dear and uh, esteemed um, colleague. We know each other since a couple of years. Um, I was still working in Jena in Germany when we, when we first met and we were both working on topics of, uh, of, the, of the brutal end of the First World War. So Thomas uh, published his um, PhD on Le Martyr de Kiev, the Marcher of Kiev in 1919. So and it's about the violent wave, anti-Semitic wave that uh, raged through the Ukrainian and Polish speaking and other, other um, countries at the very end of the First World War quite forgotten chapter. But uh, today, as also is the focus of our institute, we focus on the Second World War and um, the pogrom in Lviv, which is quite well known, but I'm absolutely sure that Thomas is showing us um, uh, with, with a title uh, also suggests new and maybe unknown to us pictures and voices from, the, from Lviv in 1941. Uh, um, is now with us, and uh, he, had, uh, he had a fellowship not far from here in Prague, but he's heading back to Paris, where he's going to, to start um, his new position, as, a, uh, as I just learned, and I'm very happy um, to hear it. It's well-deserved um, as an assistant professor of the School for Advanced Studies uh, in the Social Sciences in, in, in Paris, with the chair, of course, it makes absolutely sense, uh, um, focusing on the history of Central European Jews. So, um, without further ado, I would uh, give the floor to you, Thomas. Thanks for, for coming, and we are very much looking forward to your presentation, which will be about 45 minutes. Then we have a little talk here on the, at the desk, and, but, but of course we will open um, it also for, for, for your questions and comments to Thomas's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jochen, for these kind words of introduction, and thank you all for being here, especially for the partners to make this possible. Um, well, with no further ado, I will dive into it. So what I would like to do today is actually to focus mostly on the pictures, on the vast amount of pictures that we have from the 1941 program in VIV. A short trigger warning before some of them are actually pretty rough, so I just want to warn you, it's not easy sometimes to watch, it's not easy to read, but I think that the picture has some kind of strength that sometimes the text don't have. But what I would like to do here is just, before we get to the pictures, to sum up what happened in Lviv in end of June, early July 1941. The Germans entered the city of Lviv that was formerly part of the Soviet annexed Western Ukraine on June 30th. The program started immediately and lasted from June 30th to July 4th, five days basically. The program made around 4,000 victims. You can see here with the numbers of victims. And it was followed on the 3rd and 4th of July by the so-called killing of the Polish professors, the execution of the Polish professors and the Polish speaking edit in Lviv. At the end of the month of July, on the 25th and 27th, something I will not talk about today, but I just need to mention, were perpetrated the so-called Pepiwa days that made 2,000 additional victims. Here I'm only presenting and only using conservative figures for the number of victims, as in my opinion, those different events are sometimes amalgamated into one continuum of violence, but actually we are seeing different moments and different patterns of violence in Lviv in 1941. The first pogrom made 2,000 victims, as I just said, 
and it was also entangled with the mass killings perpetrated by the Entats Group C in the city of Lviv at the exact same time. More than 100 pogroms were perpetrated in Western Ukraine during the summer 1941. In Eastern Galicia, so in the region around Lviv, in Eastern Galicia alone, between 7,000 and 12,000 Jews died during these pogroms. So the, large, the largest occurring pogrom was in the city of Lviv with almost one third of the victims of this period. And when it comes to pictures, we are almost entirely dependent of the images of the pogrom or VIF, actually. 100 pogroms perpetrated all around Western Ukraine, but if we look at the pictures, almost all of them come from the VIF pogrom. And in many ways, it shaped our understanding of the perpetration of anti-Jewish violence in Western Ukraine in 1941. And what I would like to do here is to offer some kind of comparison between what we know from other sources, especially from testimonies written or given in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust in the 1940s, and the pictures that we can find in Jerusalem, in Washington, a bit of everywhere in Europe. I will get into details later. So a comparison between the testimonies and the pictures. Basically using the pictures not only as illustration of the testimonies, not only as illustration of a general speech, but as proper sources for the Holocaust in a historiographical trend that is actually pretty vivid today in Europe. In the second time, I would also like to confront these pictures from the Lviv program with all the sources and situation. And my ambition is somehow to emphasize the fact that these pictures have shaped our understanding of the summer 1941 pogroms. And doing that may have created, certainly have created, in my opinion, some blind spots. So, one last thing that I would like to say is that I won't comment the German footage that you may know of this event in Lviv in 1941. This footage stages the liberation of the city by the Wehrmacht, the helpless population, huge quotation mark everywhere, as you can imagine, the helpless population, the discovery of the Soviet presence and the violence against the local Jewish population as retaliation that the German soldiers cannot prevent. But actually, it's a typ typical piece of propaganda, of German propaganda, that actually doesn't picture any Jewish casualty. And during the, the program is actually not pictured in this film, even though it's usually used as the perfect illustration of the program of 1941. And this footage mostly emphasized racial stereotypes and propagated the Jewish Bolshevik myth. But I think I needed to mention this, uh, this footage before getting to the pictures. I'd rather like to focus on pictures taken by locals or by German rank and fight soldiers without the explicit purpose of immediate publication or immediate propaganda use. One major limit here, and I promise you this is a uh, end of my introduction. One major limit here is that we don't know much, if not nothing, about the photographers. And at best, we know if they were either locals or Germans. It's so it's the first blind spot that we have that we don't know who have taken these pictures. But because these pictures were taken by rank and file soldiers or by locals, they allow moving away from the question, the important question, and we, I think we can go back to this question later in the discussion, of the responsibility of the different actors in the program. So I think we can move a little bit away from this question and rather focus on the perpetration of the program itself, underground, in the streets of the city. And I think that with these photographs, we can address at least four issues. First, the question of the enrollment of the local population in the program and in anti-Jewish violence in general. Then the interactions between Ukrainian nationalists and the crowd and what it says about what happened during this program in Lviv. And then in a third time, the interactions between the programists and the German occupiers. And finally, if I have time, and I hope I will have time, I would like to consider what the pictures tell us about the Jewish victims of the programs. I need to keep an eye on the clock, because I know myself. So, before we get started, I would like to use this map as a VIF Center for Urban History. We made a terrific job in actually geolocalizing the different pictures that I will use today. They are made 
a tremendous job in a lot of fields, especially lately by housing refugees from eastern Ukraine and by documenting the current war in Ukraine, and I really wanted to acknowledge them first. But the, before that, they were actually specialized in Holocaust history. And I don't know if you are familiar with the city of Lviv. Here you are the old town. Here the central square with the opera house over there. And here you have the different prisons from the Soviet authorities. <laughs> Go back to the mic. So as you can see at first glance, it's actually the fact that the pictures were taken a bit of everywhere in the city. And we actually can have different aspects of the program taken during different days of the program, during the five days, actually. And as an entry point to the question of the local involvement of the local population in the program, we'd like to use this series of photographs that are coming from the US, um, the US, the US Holocaust Memorial. Um, museum archives in Washington, D.C. This series of photos, we actually have only two series of pictures from the program. Others are scattered in different collections, but here it's a series. We don't know who the photographer was, but we can see that he or she was a local. I'm tempted to say he for social reason and the social view of our photograph at this time. The first three pictures are taken from his balcony then he's getting down on the street. And what I think is, in, is important here is that at each time he took a picture of a moment of violence. People getting beaten on their way to the nearby so former Soviet prison. But I also think that what is interesting is that the set of pictures follows the rapid involvement of the photographer in the program. At first, he is a bystander and watches from his balcony. He becomes a spectator, an interested spectator, and takes several pictures of the same event. And then he, go down, he goes down and bled with the crowd and participate in the program. And first thing first, it was, the event was interesting from the beginning for him because he took his camera and decided that it was important enough to photograph it. So he's getting at least curious at the beginning, and then involved in anti-Jewish violence. And at the end, he's not a passive spectator. Good. So this is one of the pictures from the balcony. But at the end, he's not a passive spectator. The fact that he's here, that he takes a picture, is an interaction with the programmist group that actually salutes him in return. And I really hope that you can see the picture clearly. So a key aspect of the program exemplified here by the photographer is that the program is a moment where people who were not preparing for violence, were not coordinating themselves for violence, get to participate, get to get involved in anti-Jewish violence and play a role in supporting the perpetuation of anti-Jewish violence. But let's go back to the balcony for a minute because the point now that I would like to address, it's not only the fact that taking photographs is not a neutral action. It's the different actors involved in the program. And this picture taken from the balcony is actually pretty interesting because you can see almost everyone on it. You can see especially at the center at the, on the right of the picture a German soldier. And on his right, a man with an armband. The armband is a sign of the participation in the so-called Ukrainian militia that played a key role in the perpetration of the program in Lviv in summer 1941 and basically in the whole Western Ukraine. So a German soldier is walking around with a large crowd that remains in the background and a man with a armband is actually somehow organizing the violence on the ground because here you can see that a man is getting beaten. And so I've just used the, violin, the red mark here to emphasize the, the armband. The armband, you can see it basically everywhere on the different pictures from the program. The Ukrainian militia was constantly active during the program, something that had been widely emphasized by the recent historiography. And here, 
on this picture as well, you can see that he's not only wearing a armband, but also he has a gun, something that is actually pretty rare on the rest of the pictures. So the Ukrainian militia was coordinated, and it was an immediate threat for the Jewish population. Recent research has documented the anti-Semitic platform of the Ukrainian militia widely. And especially it has emphasized the fact that the militia was infiltrated by the Oun B. The Oun, the Organization for Ukrainian Nationalists, the Bandera fraction was the most radical fraction in the Oun during the summer 1941 and already during the 30s. And I here, I've only used one example of the political agenda that was set by the OUNB and by the militia during the summer 1941. I think it's important sometimes to quote the different elements. First, the fact that they want to infiltrate the militia, and this document is actually pretty important because it's part of the instructions for, from the revolutionary re leadership of the OUNB for the organization of local activists preparing for the German invasion in June 1941. So what are they telling the activists? That the local, the Ukrainian militia, so the security organ is for us the people's militia or militia for short, organized on the basis of self-defense. The following instructions should, uh, should show how to start organizing the militia from its grassroots organs, villages, collective farms, factory, etc., up to the whole region. We consider the militia organized in this way to be a, a temporary and single state security organ. So it's a key player for the OUNB in implementing any kind of Ukrainian power in so-called liberated part of, of Soviet Ukraine. The other aspect is the political agenda. You can see that in this instruction, they are clearly identifying their enemies. I won't quote everything, but Moscari, the bad Moscovites, Jews, Poles, any kind of foreigners, and of course, any participant in the Soviet power during the annexation between 1939 and 1941. So in other words, during the spring 1941, before the invasion of the Soviet Union by the German army, the OUN and the OUNB in particular carried a radical nationalist agenda in line with other fascist movement in Europe. This plan entailed indiscriminate use of political violence with a specific focus on ethnic minorities, especially the Jewish minority. And in several places in Western Ukraine, the Germans reported that many Ukrainians were helpful in denouncing the Jews, organizing a pogrom, or assisted the organization of a pogrom by the German forces, especially because they were key in identifying Jewish homes. So this is the kind of organization that these men represent here on this picture. But what I think is important to mention is the fact that actually when the Ukrainian militia entered Lviv, there were basically 200 of them, a very small group. Activists, coordinated, but a small group. And in my opinion, you cannot understand the decisive action during the program if you don't take into consideration other actors. And here I would just want to mention them because I will get to them later. But the crowd that you can see on the back that is actually looking at the scene another scene of violence made that are actually kept and that will be beaten later. And on the very front, a German soldier that you can recognize with his uniform. So they are certainly a key player in this moment of anti-Jewish violence in Ukraine, but they are not the only one. And once again, it's a matter of interactions between the different actors that will lead to the program. One, point that I would like to emphasize with these two extract of testimonies is actually the level of coordination. We can see that they were not merely activists in town, active in town. They were a coordinated activist leading for anti-Jewish violence. And here in these two testimonies that you can see that are actually getting from building to building to chase Jews for forced labor and for violence. There is Always this tension in the history of pogrom, Jochen has mentioned the fact that I've actually worked for a long time on the 1919 pogroms before that. There is always a tension between the degree of organization and some kind of spontaneity. 
If it's too organized, in my opinion, it's not a program anymore. The crystal nart, I know it's supposed to be called a program, but it's not a program anymore. It's a state policy. If it's only spontaneous, well, usually it fades away pretty quick. So you already have this tension. And here you can see this tension, especially in the second extract of the testimony. And we just read it briefly. A group of Ukrainian youth led by the house manager, also Ukrainian, broke into the apartment. So you have this group of armed men, or at least threatening men, this Ukrainian youth. But you also have the house manager. The house manager is probably not a Ukrainian activist from the OUN. He's just the house manager that will just give a hand for chasing Jews in the building. And at the end, you can see that scarcely had I realized what was happening when I was dragged out into the street where Jews were being gathered from nearby houses. And here is the scene that you can imagine. Jews getting dragged from their apartment. And actually, this picture is very interesting. This is probably one of the very first pictures of the pogrom. It was taken on the first day. Three things important, in my opinion, to analyze in this picture. The first one, on the very left of the picture, you can see there is a man that is wearing a Vishivanka, a broided shirt, Ukrainian shirt. It's it's important, in my opinion, that we do not project something that we don't know on the picture. So I will not say that wearing a Vishivanka in Lviv in 1941 is a sign, a symbol of participation in the OUN or anything. Today, it's actually something pretty common in Ukraine. Actually, I've got two, and I love them. And I'm not a Ukrainian nationalist from the OUN, I promise you. Um, but it's not uh, something that you wear on a daily basis. It's what we call in friends uh, Sunday clothes. So I don't know if this man was uh, an activist from the OUN, if he was a member of the Ukrainian militia, but what I know for sure that for him it was a special day, a special day to the point that he was wearing his best, most beautiful shirt. And this day of celebration was the day the German army came in Lviv. And he not only was a witness to the entrance of the German army in Lviv, he also apparently played a key role in gathering the Jewish population of the city to get beaten or killed. So what is important here as well in the program is that you can participate even though you were not prepared to participate in the first place. Two other important things on this picture is actually here you can see a Jewish woman who's smiling at the camera. She doesn't know yet what is going to happen. That's also why we know it's coming from the first day of the pogrom. None of them have been beaten yet. And this Jewish woman is smiling at the camera. She's smiling because she's scared, probably. She's smiling because she's seeing a camera in front of her. We know that it does something to us. I don't know. But even in this moment, there is some kind of agency for the Jewish victims. It's always important to remember. But there is also some kind of agency for the spectators, the bystanders. Especially this man here that you can see is laughing at the Jewish victims. He's apparently not dragging them to I don't know where. He's not actually part of this organized or not so organized militia, but he's laughing at the future victims. Other aspect from this Militia is actually the fact that, especially thanks to John Polchimka, a historian from Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine and Canada, who has extensively studied this aspect, we have found, he has found actually, the different men in the archives of the militia, of the Ukrainian militia, on the pictures. And here you have one example, I don't know if you can recognize it, it's pretty convincing in my opinion. But what I think is important is that we know for sure that this man was part of the Ukrainian militia, but here on the picture he's not wearing an arban or a gun. So two hypotheses here. John Polhinka made the hypothesis that actually there were own activists in plain clothes acting as civilians. So that's probably a good hypothesis, but the other one that I would like to make is actually the fact that a lot of people joined the militia after the program or during the program, that the program was a good opportunity to get a job and to get a job with a gun in times of crisis. And obviously to follow an 
anti-Semitic political agenda, if I have to mention it once again. So, let's have a look at this different kind of popular implication, popular participation in the, in the program beyond the local militia. You can see on this picture actually something that is very common in the different pictures. A man smoking a cigarette, visibly enjoying the, the sunny afternoon in Lviv, slapping a Jewish victim. He is once again visibly not part of the militia, he's just hanging around with the Jewish victims, but he thinks it's a good opportunity for him to slap someone, to participate actively in the violence. Something that we can see in a lot of pictures, I won't present uh, not all of them, definitely not, but this one is pretty striking in my opinion because we can see on, the, uh, on it, it's a crop uh, aspect of, the, of this picture. Here, we can see that someone is, we can see the face reflecting some kind of hatred of the Jewish victim, against the Jewish victims. And a Jewish victim that is, I don't know how to call it, dragged to the ground by someone with brutality. But these are the most active participants in the program. Even though they are not all own activists, they are definitely active programists and violent men. I will get to women later. But what is also extremely important to have in mind is the crowd, something I've mentioned before. Because the crowd is a key element in the program. It's some kind of passive, but not so passive, support to anti-Jewish violence. And here you can see on a series of pictures that actually the crowd is everywhere. The whole city is hanging around in, on the sidewalks, on the streets, etc., etc. And actually, you can see, especially on this picture, that they are waiting. This is on the previ previous picture as well. They are waiting, enjoying the show and waiting for additional violence. We are in July, we are in Vif, it's basically the same weather that here. So it takes some kind of organization, some kind of patience to witness this kind of show, of horrific show. You can see, especially at the back of this picture, that people are waiting on the grass, sitting here, just to witness with a clear view and a better view. What they are also doing is enjoy the public humiliation, especially near the NKVD prisons, because I haven't talked about yet about the reason, huge quotation mark, of this program. It's a discovery on June 30th of the victims of the Soviet security organs uh, of their victims in the Lviv prisons, on the three Lviv prisons. So thousands of people have been shot before the Soviet army retreated. And in these thousands of people, you can find 80% of Ukrainian, most of them are Ukrainian activists or Ukrainian elites. This is the reason why the Ukrainian nationalists and actually the German army as well are organizing this kind of horror, horrific show in the prisons. And especially they are forcing the Jewish, local Jewish population to dig up the corpses and to witness what happened in the prisons. And actually, you can see that the picture here on the left has been taken in the prison because the person behind him, behind the, the victim, are actually suffocating from the smell of the corpses in the prison. And the picture on the right has been taken, actually you can recognize, if you know it, you can recognize the prison as well behind. And she, this victim has to be humiliated on her way to the prison. So the three prisons in the city are really most focusing the attention during the fourth moment of the program. Nevertheless, you can see that the violence spread immediately. It's not only in the prison, like on the left, but outside and nearby the gates as well. And especially you have this moment, this other series that I would like to, to focus on immediately, of pictures that were taken near the Opera House on the large square at the very center of the, of the city of Lviv. And you can see that on this series of pictures, once again, the photographer is an active participant in the violence. He's not only witnessing, he's also supporting the perpetration of violence by taking several pictures. But he's taking pictures of humiliation. 
humanization of the Jewish population that were not only forced to dig up the corpses in the NKVD prisons, but to clean up the streets as well and to be humiliated that way. Here is just another testimony that I found to quote. You, a Ukrainian sat on a Jew's back and forced him to run, during which he kept beating his victim on the head with a stick until the latter fell fainting. Others did the same and counted in ingenuity. All this was accompanied by the eerie holes of the victims in pain and the triumphant cries of the torturers. And here, once again, you cannot see any armband, any uniform. The militia is not there. The army, the German army, all the Ukrainians fighting in the German army are not there. You can only see the crowd. And especially in the crowd, this person, that actually struck me, was laughing at the camera. It's a cropped version. And once again, I don't want to project something on the picture. Is, is she smiling or laughing at the scene? Is she smiling or laughing at the photographer himself? If she un uncomfortable, we, can, we know that sometimes we laugh when we are uncomfortable. I don't know. I know for sure that she is witnessing something and that actually next to her, you can see the Jewish victim was looking at a, at a programmist on the right. So once again, she's trying to express some very tiny part of resistance in this scene. But who is the crowd? I've mentioned several times men, and especially in the different pictures, you can see that it's a large part of men, but you can always see women on these different pictures. It's important to mention because the Ukrainian militia the German military or the Ukrainian military under German command are all men, it's obvious. And on every picture you can see that women and children are participating in the program. So it's a key aspect of the program that it allows people who are not supposed to commit violence most of the time, even in a, our society, women and children, to participate. And sometimes in this kind of where you can see that the child is attacking someone with a broom. On this picture, you can see that actually a, a woman is beating a Jewish woman with a broken broomstick. So they are using basically everything that they have with them. But once again, it's an important aspect that these pictures emphasize. Then another aspect of discussion was it's in, the, in this crowd. Are they only Ukrainians? Barely 20% 20, 20 of the local population of Lviv was Ukrainian, actually, at this time. It, the vast majority of the population was Polish, more than 50%, and one third was Jewish. So the vast majority of the local population is Polish. And to such extent, actually, that I found a report from the OUNM, so the other faction from the Ukrainian nationalist, that quoted, between the departure of the Bolsheviks and the arrival of the Germans, the Poles, on their own authority, organized a Jewish pogrom in order perhaps to certify the Polishness of Lviv. This report is obviously completely wrong. It's missing the crucial point that the Oun B, the other faction of the Oun, is the key actor in this scene. But actually, there are so many Poles participating in anti-Jewish violence that this Ukrainian activist underground is explaining the program by the action of Poles, of local Poles and Polish activists. So this means that actually a large part of the local population participated either Ukrainian or Polish. Last aspect after this national aspect, the social aspect. In several testimonies, we can see that the witnesses mentioned the fact that the pogromists were thugs, criminal elements, etc., etc. something that comes actually pretty regularly in pogrom testimonies. Actually, you can see on the different pictures, if you can see, I don't know, this one probably, that actually probably, once again, I don't want to project everything on, on this image, but you can see that you have basically all the classes of the society represented in one picture. Workers on the left, probably a house worker. You can see men with just a shirt here and a cap probably a worker, or I don't know, but on the right you have someone with a tie, probably from a higher class, etc., etc. So here, 
most of the Jewish victims are actually projecting their violence on the social condition of the pogromists, but in my opinion, all the classes of the local society participated in the pogrom, as we can see on the different pictures. So, Ukrainian nationalists, the crowd, then one last actor is important to mention, the German army and the German presence. It's important to mention the fact that they were actually in town at the end of the month of June, as you can see on these two pictures, especially the one on the right was taken on this central square, in the center, in very center of Lviv, and explicit the fact that actually we can see that there was some kind of parade. It's in every testimony, literally every testimony, that the Germans were taking pictures and filming the pogrom during the days. And you can see here just two examples. And here I'm just coming back to the, what I've mentioned before. Taking pictures is not a passive action. Well, it's participation in the pogrom, it's some kind of support, indeed some kind of interaction. So even though obviously the victims are mentioning their the pogromists who are beating them, so the Ukrainians and the local populations. Nevertheless, we cannot say with them that the Germans did not take part in the pogrom. It's not true. They were active all the time, and you can see them on a lot of pictures. Here, you can see on the right, so that's one of the first pictures on the balconies that I've mentioned. And actually, they were taking pictures for themselves. I especially like this one because it was found on eBay by the Central for Urban History, uh, Olvif. And if it was not for the inscription behind, so you done in Lemberg, we would not know that it was taken during the pogrom. It's just a short picture with the size of my hand probably that was taken by a rank and file soldier just witnessing the thing and enjoying the show. Then once again, in every picture, we can see that the Germans are everywhere. And the interaction between the German occupiers and Ukrainian pogromists is unclear on the official level. No specific order was given, no correspondence between the OUN and the SS or the Abwehr mentioned any agreement about anti-Jewish violence in general or pogrom in particular. In a way, the interaction was negotiated on the ground. And in Lviv, it was negotiated between the Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian militia and, the, and that group C but we can find different configurations in basically every newly occupied town and city in Western Ukraine. Just to give you two examples, in Ternopil, for example, the Germans summoned the, Ukrainian, the local Ukrainian committee to help prepare a program. While in Glinyani, the Ukrainian committee appealed to the Germans to, to start an anti-Jewish campaign and a program. So you can see basically different configuration in different cities. But what about Lviv? Even though it's obvious from both German and local photos that German soldiers held the city and were omnipresent, they are actually pushed into the background by the photographer on this picture that I find actually probably one of the most important pictures of this set. Because you can see that we came from Germans, sorry, I'm going back here, in the middle of the street, to German pushed to the sidewalk due to anti-Jewish violence. Anti-Jewish violence was a way for Ukrainian nationalists to occupy public space as well and to push the Germans. A way to literally occupy the streets and the city and the city center where the Germans have arrived and to leave them on the sidewalk. In other words, Ukrainians, or should I say Ukrainian nationalists and German occupants were equal or even competitor in occupying the city due to this use of anti-Jewish violence. And that's maybe because I'm French, but in my opinion, an occupier army usually looks like that. <laughs> Triumphant army occupying a city where you can see no one in the background, basically. It's a completely different situation in Lviv at this time, because here you can see that they are on the right. What also is also important to mention is actually the fact that it was not for nothing that the Ukrainian nationalists tried to push the Germans on the sidewalk. Basically, their point was to proclaim or to restore, as they say, a Ukrainian state in Lviv. Here, I'll just give you two examples. On the left is a newspaper stating the proclamation of the restoration of the Ukrainian state. 
And on the right, it's actually a letter from the uh, from Andrei Cheptitsky, the Archbishop uh, from Lviv, supporting the creation of a Ukrainian state. Under the authority of Stetsko, that you can see here in the picture, the Lieutenant from ban of Bandera, so the second in the OUNB, so a very nationalist, very radical, very anti-Semitic Ukrainian activist, but that was trying to fight for an independent Ukraine. Collaborationist, but independent Ukraine, something that the Germans didn't want at the time, that actually they never allowed during the war. Another point that I would like to mention is actually a bit of an explanation of an interpretation that was given once again by John Paul Rimka. It's the fact that this pogrom was some kind of carnival for the pogromists. As you can see, especially from this testimony that mentioned the fact that the pogromists pulled out Jews from there, from there and made them clean streets and sewers, city toilets and so on, something that we have seen before. It was terribly humiliating feeling to see doctors and professors standing with shovels in their hand, cleaning streets and shovels and traveling. So basically, this carnival is a world turned upside down. It's professors and doctors forced to clean the street. And in my opinion, it's, I do not completely disagree with this interpretation of the program as a carnival, but a carnival is maybe a couple of days, a week maybe, where the world is turned upside down. It's not a political agenda that you're trying to push by anti-Jewish violence political agenda that goes for Ukrainian nationalists until the proclamation or the restoration of Ukrainian state, some kind of collaboration with local Poles, something that, haven't, that we haven't seen before in this region, where there was a huge competition between Ukrainian nationalists and Polish nationalists, and a collaboration with the Germans. So a carnival is maybe not the best metaphor to act describe this scene and to, in my, opinion, in my opinion, to interpret the VIV program. So, because I'm getting long, I need to rush to my, to my conclusion. So I don't want to disregard this aspect, but maybe one of the most horrible, it's about the victims of the program and actually the pattern of violence of the program. We have seen a lot of pictures depicting violence on the street in Lviv during these days in summer 1941. Does it mean that Jewish victims were numerous on the street? Actually not. You can see here on this picture that few people were hanged during this scene of forced cleaning on the street near the opera. You can see here that people were beaten to death on the street on their way to the prisons, like this one and people were left on the sidewalk. But to what extent were this kind of popular scene of violence deadly? Not so much, to be honest. Because something that we sometimes forget in this program, and I believe we forget because we have a lot of pictures of popular violence and of this coordinated Ukrainian violence, is the fact that the Germans were responsible for the highest casualties during the program. And of that, we only have, in my, at my knowledge, only one picture, or two, maybe, taken in the prison. Because people arrived in the prison, sorry, I'm rushing a bit to, to, to the conclusion, but people arrived in the prison, mostly wounded. Here I've just cycled people who were wounded on their way to the prison, but they arrived alive, most of them, in the prison. And who was active in the prison? It was the German and the Ukrainian nationalist that started to organize immediately mass killings in the prisons with guns, with grenades, and with machine guns. And in the prisons here, you can see that you have a lot of corpses, actually. But it's not the only place where people were killed. There's something about which we don't have any picture, is the fact that actually the Enzat Commando 6 organized a site of mass killing in the stadium of the city. And in this stadium, according to a post-war trial of Erwin Schulz, the commander of the Einsatzkommando 6, um, that describes the following scene, the Einsatzkommando directed the militia to arrest people from the Jewish population of Lviv, together with anyone vaguely involved in the late June executions by the NKVD. So we have this Jewish Bolshevik myth playing at full, and about 
2,500 to 3,000 people, mostly Jews, were sized and assembled on the outskirts of Vif on the athletic field or stadium. And the next day, members of the Enzatz Commando 6 and 8 started mass shootings while Ukrainian militiamen provided security and assistance in the mass killing. A thing, unfortunately, that we know very well of this Holocaust by Buddhist, typical of the Eastern Europe. And actually, that's something that we tend to forget when we are only focusing on the scene on the streets. Nevertheless, I would like to address one last pattern of violence that is pretty vivid in the different pictures, is sexual violence, something that we actually don't see much in Western Ukraine at the time, or at least not to such extent. We have a lot of pictures of sexual violence perpetrated against Jewish women and Jewish men, actually, pictures of humiliation of Jewish men stripped naked, but mostly women, obviously, during this event. I try to emphasize the fact that actually this program allowed to broaden the spectrum of participants to basically everyone who wanted to. It also broadened the spectrum of victims. Most of the victims at the stadium or typically in these first days of occupation in Western Ukraine were men. But with sexual violence, Jewish women became immediately potential victims from the pogromists or from German soldiers. Not necessarily victim of killing at this time in July, nevertheless, we can see that usually in several times, sexual violence led to death, like it's always the case. But we can see also that actually it was a way to humiliate, but also to target Jewish women from the very first days of the occupation of the Soviet territory. I won't stay long on these pictures because they are pretty rough. But the last point that I wanted to address is the fact that actually this picture of, this is a Wikipedia page from the Lviv program, this picture of sexual violence against the Jewish women in Lviv is used as this typical picture of the pogrom in Lviv. As I've tried to emphasize, it was not so much typical of the pogroms during the summer 1941. It was not typical even for the Lviv pogrom. And vast majority of the, of the people killed were killed were men. But by mobilizing this picture as an iconic depiction of a moment of barbaric collective violence, we tend to downplay the organized dimension of the 1941 programs, in my opinion, in general and in Lviv in particular. In a way, we tend to bury the limited but decisive responsibility of small groups of men, militiamen, local activists, German security services, German and Ukrainian soldiers, small groups of men who systematically organize the persecution of a local Jewish population and the overwhelmment of the local non-Jewish population. We turn it into a carnival, <clears throat> a show where women could be targeted in some kind of barbaric event that is not part of the Holocaust or only at the outskirts of the Holocaust. To conclude, yes, quickly. The term pogrom, even in its, in its original Russian meaning, is metaphorical and sometimes vague. During the first half of the 20th century, it encompassed various events, such as poorly armed urban crowds in 1905 Odessa, for example, and well-disciplined soldiers and mass killings in 1919. And did pogromists in summer 1941 Ukraine understand the act within this tradition or did they use this tradition to implement an independent Ukrainian state? In my opinion, they did. Pogrom serves them as a violent instrument for achieving the long-term goal of the ethnic cleansing of their territory with regard to the Jews and to the implementation of a Ukrainian independent state. The historian Joel Polinka, that I've quoted several times today because he made a ter terrific job, wrote a seminal article that the Germans created in a seminal article, sorry, that the Germans created the condition of the outbreak of the pogrom, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists provided the engine of the pogrom, and that the crowd participated actively. And we tend to forget the crowd most of the time, the question of responsibility of the different actors. But Imka tries to specify the level of responsibility of the different parts. And I will argue that the whole point of the pogrom is to blur the lines between pogromists between the audience, the participants, the non-participants, the bystanders, the activists, the opportunists, everyone could participate, and that's the whole point of the program. 
this absence of boundaries is also a test for popular support. In some places, when there was no popular support, the program short-lived and immediately gave way to typical executions. But program also allows the participation of a wide part of the population, including women and children. But if you think in terms of killing efficiency, it actually proved to be quite inefficient. And we know very well this report from Idrich would tend to disregard programs as a waste of energy and time and to prefer mass killings. But the picture allows us to answer the question of what's in a program and who is in the crowd during the summer 1941 in Lviv. There is a certain degree of organization, a certain degree of improvised brutality, constant interactions between programmists, the crowd, and the occupants, and the Germans were confirmed in two aspects. The, barbarity, the barbaric brutality of the NKVD, led by Jewish commissars, and the support of an active part of the local population. A few hundred Germans, backed by a few hundred Ukrainian militiamen, occupied Lviv on June 30th. After four days, there were a community of thousands of people that benevolently witnessed or actively participated to some degree to the persecution of the local Jewish population that wasn't safe through the whole city, on the street, in their apartments, either they were poor, rich, men or women, young or old. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Thomas, for 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 um, this 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 lecture, and for this um, combination of what you did as a as an analysis <coughs> analysis of the of the of the script, as we sometimes also read it in the literature of the of the Lviv pogrom of 1941, and uh, in connection with the imagination imaginary of the illustration of the of the of the photos, I, I'm I'm sure that also many in the audience recognized some of those iconic pictures and uh, and um, I uh, I was especially um, my, my, uh, my attention was drawn by the, as one of the sentence you used first that uh, photos do not only create images but they also uh, create voids by what is not covered by those um, uh, uh, pictures your um, you showed the, the Wikipedia entry at the very end with a, with a, with a drastic picture of the woman that, that um, was, was harassed sexually and running through the streets of, of Lviv. And, um, and, and images create, um, create narratives and create um, um, images, create imaginations. No? So it, I, I found it very important that you, that you um, put the pogrom in Lviv also into the context of the German occupation of the of the before of the Soviet occupation of the of the killings in the in the NKVD prisons and then and then the ongoing um, persecution of the Jewish population in Lviv for for the for the first couple of days of the German um, occupation. So, <clears throat> on the one hand, um, and you also also uh, you drew our attentions to this at the, at your closing remarks. But I would encourage you to elaborate on it if you want to um, a little further, because this is also our our also our common um, area of interest. And you you hinted at at these. Um, different levels, but also continuities between anti-Jewish violence during the first Russian revolution in 95, um, then um, the, the 1919 violence that, that uh, we both talked about at the very end of the First World War, which, which happens in areas where the Germans had been occupants as well, but didn't take, did not take part in, in large-scale anti-Jewish violence or murder, as we, as we know. And then the 1941 um, situation, especially with a view on, <clears throat> on the interpretation of the, of the violence. Uh, you, you know it better than I do that at the very end of the First World War, we don't have the exact figures but in the Ukrainian-speaking lands and also partly in the Polish-speaking lands, we have these programs that, that um, produce, um, excuse me the, the, the word, but, but with the, there we have a figure of victims that we don't know exactly, but 
it's probably between 100 and 200,000 victims. So, and still we have this, this difference with, with one, the occupational framework of first the Soviets and then the Germans in 41, and before we have this violence as, as a part of a, of, of, a, of a, you also sometimes use the, the, the term civil war in this time, and, um, and, and as you also said, and I would very much agree, state building violence. So maybe you can, can elaborate a little bit more on the, on the parallels and on the differences between um, the post-First World War violence and the um, initial violence at the German, during the German attack on the Soviet Union in 41 in the summer. Uh, gladly, thank you very much for these uh, important questions. Um, yeah, about the continuity before we start. Well, the first continuity that we have here in Lviv is actually an important one, that there was already a program in 1918, on November 11th, 1918, just after the proclamation of the independence of Poland. And actually, the program was the continuation of the the war, the ongoing war between Ukrainian nationalists from Western Ukraine and the Polish nationalists in Lviv. And basically the Polish army accused the Jews of backing the Ukrainian nationalists and then persecuted the Jewish population of Lviv, making, I can't remember exactly, I think it's 30 something victims. So small pogroms, huge quotation marks, but the small pogroms in this context of anti-Jewish violence after the 1917 revolution. Um, the most deadly programs were in central Ukraine at the time. Um, so already here we have this kind of Jews taken, in, be, caught between fires of this state building violence, state building violence by the Polish army or by the Ukrainian, Western Ukrainian army. But actually the main difference here with the other programs of the civil war period, as we usually call them after the 1917 revolution in Ukraine, if we think in general, that actually anti-Jewish violence was used to wage war. It was a way for the Ukrainian nationalists in central Ukraine, especially for the peasant, peasant insurrections, sorry, or even sometimes by the Red Army, to wage war, just to find food, to find money, and to find a shelter. So you have always had this aspect that you could not wage war without persecuting a part of the population. For the Reds, most of the time, it was not the Jewish population, it was the bourgeoisie. But actually, for almost every other armies on the ground in central Ukraine and in western Ukraine at the time, it was the Jewish population that was used to fuel the army. So here we have a different context, in my opinion. The Ukrainian militia doesn't, is not, first of all, is not an army just a few hundred activists. They don't need to persecute and to plunder the Jewish, local Jewish population. Actually, we don't have much examples of plunder during this program, which is quite rare. During a, a program in 1919, the first thing that the program is do is plunder the local population. First thing. It's actually the pattern of violence. They plunder the Jewish population, then sometimes they kick them, they beat them, and usually they kill them to a certain extent, and they rape the women. But here the plunder is almost absent. There is at the very beginning, at the very beginning of the people are to, uh, dragged to the, um, to the prison, there is this excuse somehow of the forced labor. We need Jews to dig up the corpses and to clean up the streets. But it's just an excuse. And we can see with the humiliations near the opera house where the, the, Jewish, the local Jews are forced to clean up the streets, that it's just an excuse. The forced labor, the anti-Semitic, the anti-Jewish aspect the anti-Jewish violence aspect of the forced labor is already there. So it's a, it's a highly politicized form of violence in Lviv in 1941, something that we cannot see actually in 1919. There is obviously a political dimension to anti-Jewish violence in 1919, but it's always entangled with other logics. And here we don't have that. And that's something I wanted to also to emphasize in my presentation. Actually, if we think in terms of continuity, the 1918 program was the moment of conflict between the Polish and Ukrainian population. The 1941 program is a moment of, of truth, let's say, even maybe of communion in anti-Jewish violence. And I also think that's why it was so important for the Ukrainian militia to create this climate of anti-Jewish violence basically to avoid any kind of political conflict with the Polish population, with the majority of the city, 
once again, 50% of the population. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what, what also struck me is um, what you drew our attention to is that um, this, this combination of uh, the, the, di the different groups of, of people that are participating in the, in the pogroms, and you, you empathized uh, the small, relatively small number of Ukrainian nationalists who, who were highly already politicized and were already, um, yeah, in a way prepared for the pogrom in May. I, I didn't know that, uh, by the way. Um, that. Yeah, and even before that. Um, and then the participation of, of, of a local uh, civil, civil population. Um, I was reminded on, uh, and, and again, I don't want to draw our attention now back again to 1918 because our focus is now 1941, but um, we have already also discussed the seminal uh, book <clears throat> that has been published two or three years ago by William Hagen on anti-Jewish violence, violence in the Polish lands, and he makes, makes his point that the, the 1918 or 1919 uh, pogroms take part mostly if a small group, for example, of soldiers is entering a certain city or town, and then they start it, and then the population um, um, uh, sets in, uh, which he explains with a, with a mixture, and, and the, 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 the mortar, which puts it all together, of course, is anti-Semitism. Yeah? Um, and it, it's popular anti-Semitism, which goes way, way back to, to medieval uh, superstition, and, and then the anti-Semitism that is uh, an ethnic... Um, anti-Semitism uh, drawn by, by the political violence of creating an ethnic nation state without Jews. Mm -hmm. yeah? So um, uh, now you, you, you were arguing that the, the violence in, in 41 is mostly, if it comes n not only from the Germans, but especially here from the Ukra Ukrainian side, about political violence. <clears throat> so what, what is your estimation or what your, your idea about the role of popular anti-Semitism in, in the pogroms in 41? Well, even before that, I'm not entirely convinced by the explanation by popular traditional yeah. anti-Semitism in 1918, 1919. Sure, we can find this element of accusation that are very typical. The Jews are speculating, they are, they are desecrating the churches, etc., etc. But it's, especially with the 1917 revolution and with the, the fall of the Russian Empire, we are, in my opinion, on a complete different level the level of state building violence, of nation state, and of a threat that is somehow apocalyptic for the, for the political actors at the time, that the threat of the Soviet revolution. There is a complete change in scale for, for the actors. Even though these different elements are entangled and by fighting against the speculation, they are fighting against the Jews, and we can fight these different elements. But, What's at stake, in my opinion, is already different in 1918, 1919, but it's also very different here in 1941. We cannot see, at, at my knowledge, and I, well, I'm not the only one, we have read uh, dozens of testimonies of uh, Jewish victims and the different elements from the, from the Oun, for example, that there is nothing typical of this anti-Jewish prejudice that we could find before that. From the very beginning, the Oun is a uh, radical, radical ethno-nationalist party, very close from a fascist party. So the traditional dimension of anti-Semitism or prejudice against the Poles, for example, etc., is not very, it's not there, basically. And the political dimension is always there, building a Ukrainian state and fighting against the Soviets, because this is all, of course, the actors that are not present in the pictures, but are present in everyone's mind. There is the threat of the Soviet regime that occupied and tried to annex Western Ukraine in 1939-1941, and who killed these thousands of people in the prison of the NKVD. So here, once again, we are, in my opinion, at a completely different level, and this would explain why the violence is so much radical in 1941. It was already extremely radical at the core of the, of the revolutionary Ukraine around Kyiv in 1919, where you can find extermination, ethnic cleansing, mass killings, something that you cannot see in Western Ukraine and uh, with, uh, with the Polish army. And here we are basically seeing in Lviv in 1941 something that we could see in central Ukraine 20 years before. And because, in my opinion, it's also a reaction to the policies of the Soviet regime and to the threat, very much mythicized and some kind of fantasy threat of the Soviet regime. Mm 
Yeah, thank you. I would now take the opportunity to open the discussion for the audience and for your, for your questions. I'm sure there are many of them, so please just <clears throat> go ahead and give us a sign. We have two microphones here, one in the hand of Florine and one in my hand, so don't be shy, please. Eva starts breaking the ice. Thank you, Eva. I am always happy to start. Thank you so much. It was really moving, and uh, um, I don't want to continue the discussion about the comparison between the first between First World War and Second World War experiences because I'm not an expert on it. But you used two analytical frameworks, uh, which are amazing and excellent, and I, I just want to suggest to go further. First, photography. Uh, take your wonderful Roland Barthes essay on photography to reconstruct the, the gaze. Because you started to say something about the gaze, but sti we still don't understand who are these observers? What is the power in, in his hand, uh, in the, their hands? Uh, what is the imaginary we just got right now? And we cannot go further because it's shocking. And the second point, so this is abusement. This is an aggra ag aggression. If, uh, if you read Susan, ba Susan Sontag, you will find the same point. Uh, the second uh, framework, which I really find very challenging is the carnivalic uh, aspect. And I was wondering whether you could open again Mikhail Bakhtin, who was a, an eyewitness uh, from Odessa. So that time in Odessa, when I remember correctly, observing a lot of pogroms and then establishing the structural understanding of uh, rituals. This is, this is a kind of uh, legitimation of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of violence from the part of the majority. Or we can go further this li uh, following this line. What does it mean uh, being part uh, of a carnivalic uh, uh, subversive performance? Because you concluded in the discussion with, with Johan that in, the, in, the, in this pogrom produced a kind of union between the Ukrainian and the Poles against the Jews. And I think it's a very, very strong hypothesis. And I would love to see how you can support your hypo hypothesis with the help of this framework. So thank you so much. Very, very inspiring. Oh, thank you very much, Eva. Um... Well, to come back to, to the gaze, the, maybe for, for the first question. So the issue here is that we don't know much about the photographer. And when we want to do proper social history, we cannot only project what we want to see in the photographer gaze. So that's why I always try to be cautious and to cross with different sources, because we don't know much about the photographers themselves. So it's, I think it's easy to deconstruct the gaze, especially when we have this picture from rank and file German soldiers looking for the Jewish stereotype, basically. It's easy to de deconstruct, but when we are looking at this series of pictures by locals, what, is, what their gaze is something I'm struggling with for the moment, but it's an ongoing project. <laughs> uh, I will try to think about it. Uh, about the carnival, well, Actually, yeah, I was thinking, very, I, I think that uh, actually John Polyhemka is referring to William Hagen, actually, who used that for the 1918 program, something I disagree with as well. <laughs> um, and he is actually reading Bakhtin and uh, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, who is a French historian from the modern, early modern period, who widely used this, uh, who widely analyzed actually carnivals in France especially in a Roman. The Anal School. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that I'm joining uh, <laughs> in September. Um, <laughs> let's bribe a little bit. <laughs> it was rough as a topic, so let's... <laughs> um, 
But actually, what Laura Ladurie emphasizes is the fact that a carnival is supposed to last a couple of days. And actually, when it starts to last too long, it's a threat for the authorities. It's a world turned upside down. It's a call, a brief call for equality, or at least preventing too much inequality. But it's supposed to end. The servant is not supposed to be served for the whole year. Here, in Lviv, where I think it's not a carnival, is because they are pushing a long-term political agenda. The Jews will not be back at their hypothetical place after the pogrom. Their place under a Ukrainian Oun regime would be at the very bottom of the racial, it's not a matter of phrase for the Oun, but of the national hierarchy. So here it's not a carnival in this aspect, even though you have this humiliation, but actually we can find humiliation in every moment of anti-Jewish violence. In the 40s, I'm limiting myself to the Second World War. Uh, even in, uh, I'm turning to Jochen, in 1939, uh, Poland, I think that we can find Jews being humiliated by Germans. Yeah, yeah, and of course. You have, you have also lots of pictures of that. Yeah. Uh, Jewish men being, uh, their, their beard cut, etc., etc. So, even though it's some kind of humiliation that can recall the carnival and this yeah, buffoon aspect, Nevertheless, they are pushing a political, long-term political agenda. Here, we, once again, we should not get caught by the pictures and by this, these women laughing and this scene that is completely absurd of people cleaning up the street. It's also a moment, a high, highly politicized moment, in my opinion. So I was just thinking about the read the passage character yeah. of a carnival. Mm -hmm. So to understand carnival as a structure, a framework to reach another um, consensus. Yeah. Here I think you're, you're completely right. It's a ritual, definitely. It's a way to recruit in the militia. It's a way to build a local community that is clearly un anti-Semitic. But once again, the carnival is not the only ritual. And especially in these societies, you have ritual for basically everything. But just to echo your, your comment, actually, it, I, I was quite surprised that we couldn't see other kind of rituals in Western Ukraine in 1941, especially religious rituals, or I don't know, parade or this kind of thing. It comes later, actually, when the political, when the Ukrainian collaborationists are structuring the collaboration, they are starting to parade with the Vishivanki, with the, with the Pope, etc. But it's not in summer 1941. We can see this call for Sheptitsky, who is basically doing nothing during the, the program, but he's not really active. The priests or the Popes are not really active as well. And you don't have this kind of organized parade. The organized parade, the parade of the Jews dr dragged in the street and beaten on the street. So it's a kind of improvised ritual, some kind of a contradiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah indeed. Um, more questions from the audience, please. Do you want to enjoy the yeah. parks? <laughs> I was wondering whether it is possible to identify people on the um, photographs in, like in principle, or whether you try to do it, and whether this could have been helpful to respond to the question, who were there in terms of, I mean, Ukrainians, Polish, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Oh, I would love that, but I'm afraid it's really complicated. Just to use one very small example of the of the militiamen that I've uh, John Polhimka used and that I've replicated, we only have 11 cards of the militiamen. And on the 11, we can recognize two. So apparently, it's already difficult for this extremely well identified with, you know, smug shots uh, men. And I'm not even thinking about the victims. It would be almost impossible, in my opinion. And I'm maybe the most interesting part would be for the local populations. But how can you find pictures with? We are before the ID card uh, with picture. Well, at the very beginning of the ID card uh, in Poland, I'm not sure that it's easy to find. Uh, actually, actually, it is easy to find ID card application. It would be a horrific job, <laughs> probably very long. But I agree, 
could bring some results. So if you have a PhD student who is looking for a no full job, I don't know. Um, but because we are, think, we are talking about thousands of people, maybe 300,000 people. So it's really hard to find this. Yeah, maybe. Promise, promise, but. <laughs> Do we have more questions from the audience? Emily. speak loud enough without the microphone. I was wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about the ways that the different types of photos um, have been used maybe in the aftermath and especially your closing slide with the Wikipedia page and the particular image. Obviously I know Wikipedia is its own sort of creation um, but thinking about the balance of the I guess especially in connection with the ways that um, images from this pogrom of sexual violence perhaps were used in ways that have, have led to, to different imaginaries about this pogrom. Uh, thank you, excellent question as well. Um, about the use, well, it, uh, I'm not a collector of photographs. You may have seen that actually some of them are from private collections. Uh, we actually have people still trying to find some pictures of uh, the program. It's, I, I don't judge, it's a hobby. Uh, but most of them have been given to the USHMM or to Yad Vashem. Um, so, but it's also difficult sometimes to identify that it's a picture from the program. It's easy when you can recognize the opera or these kind of very typical scenes of people on the, humiliated on the street or the prisons, but these kind of small pictures are taken by German soldiers, like the one found on eBay by the V Center. It's impossible to recognize V on this, on this picture. So we may actually have a lot of pictures of the Lviv pogrom that we don't know about, or that we don't know that they are about the Lviv pogrom in the Yad Vashem archives or, or the USHM or everyone, everywhere else. But it's interesting to see that actually even today they are most of the time uh, poorly labeled. Uh, especially in the Yad Vashem, I don't know why, they should hire someone to work on the photograph archives because most of the pictures coming from the, this pogrom of the end of June, early July 1941 are labeled as Petur Petura Days, the pogrom of the, of the end of July uh, 1941. And it's impossible, the Petura Days were not organized this way, so we are still fighting against mislabeled and this kind of, this kind of issues. And then about the public history aspect of your question, but the use of photos, I'm always surprised to see that, or maybe it's a matter of copyright and everything, but I don't think it's only easy, it's not the only answer. Uh, all the same pictures are always coming back, especially the picture of sexual violence, some of the pictures taken near the prisons uh, of public humiliation, but for example, the, the picture of mass killings that should be at the very center of our I don't know, imaginary program, uh, are not there. And you have to dig into the archives to, to find them. So I think that something that is probably important in this program is actually probably surprised the victims, obviously, but even today we are surprised to see that thousands of people gathered to beat up Jews and kill them. It's and something that we can see in other other contexts. For I don't know. Let's think about Yad Vabne for a second. But we can still don't we still don't understand how thousands of people can gather to to persecute their local neighbors, their Jewish neighbors. So that may be a way to somehow make it a barbarity. In my opinion, that that's why the pictures of sexual violence are used somehow to see this is. This is not possible. These are monsters, barbarians. It's a, it's a display of brutality, but it's not an organized kind of violence because we don't want, still don't want to handle the fact that it was actually pretty much organized all the time. And it's the same thing for the so-called Holocaust by bullets. When you are take, talking about the picture of the Holocaust by bullets with students or in, the, in public history, people are always striken by the level of brutality that you can see on the pictures. And I think it's, it's some, 
maybe that I will try to be slightly optimistic and promise you I will end up. Uh, maybe that's a way also for our peaceful society to consider that it's not part of us anymore. That may be the good point here. We cannot act like this anymore. I'm not totally sure. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me with my optimism. <laughs> but. I have uh, one question related to what you just said and to the, to the method, methods you use for the interpretation of pictures as a historical source. Um, it comes to my mind also because pictures from the pogrom of Liv in 41 where um, um, uh, the, the end of an exhibition in Germany on Wehrmacht crimes um, during the Second World War, because in this exhibition at the end of the 1990s, beginning of 2000s, there were photos of the Lviv pogrom, but there were also photos of the victims of the NKVD in the prisons, and they were shown as victims of the Wehrmacht. And this mistake um, was the end of this, um, this exhibition. And then, uh, then this was a complete turning point in the in the uh, how, how to deal with photos in the context of the Second World War as a historical source. And the exhibition had been remade and two or three years later reopened with a completely different set of methods and, and of ways of interpret, 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 interpreting um, pictures as historical source and the use of it. Ne? So my question is when you, when you deal with a photo of uh, whatever photo you take, now one of those you took in your, your, your lecture, um, how do you, what is your, your approach to it? How, you, how, how do you analyze it? What, is, what are your tools that you use to, to, to put it into, into, your, um, into the framework of your argumentation? That's a, once again, an important question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that it's part of a wider effort by historians to use pictures, films as proper sources. We know that us historians usually like texts and documents and here we can also analyze pictures as proper sources. And to do that, we have to be extremely careful because we are constantly jumping to conclusion when we are looking at a picture. We are trying to create a narrative, we are trying to identify what we know from other sources is supposed to be there. So my basic method here is simply to try to analyze every element on the picture separately and then to see the interactions between the different elements. And when you analyze these different elements separately, you can see things that usually you disregard when you look at a picture. You know, the man a little blurred on the left uh, that you usually won't see, the victim that is trying to have a look and try to resist with her, with her look at the program, it's this kind of thing. You can look at them if you look at them for a long time. But actually, when we look at texts, at document, textual documents as historians, usually we are supposed to spend a long time on them, not simply read them and say, it's okay, we are supposed to know who has written, who, where, for what purpose, etc., etc. as a basic, actually, basic method of historians. So we have to apply the same basic methods to pictures, and then to cross them with other sources, especially testimonies, textual sources, etc. Because, but start with the pictures and then try to find other documents. Why most of the time, in my opinion, um, and with colleagues, they are actually starting with the documents, with the text, and then using photos as illustrations. Mm. And here I think it's the worst, especially when it comes to these kind of episodes. Mm. Because we are not supposed to use a woman Beating harassed on beating, getting beaten on the street or being harassed as an illustration of anything. Mm -hmm. But I think it's true for basically everything, mm -hmm. for every kind of picture. Yeah. Um, we, I remember, the, oh, I just want to, to remark that there is a book of Wendy Lower on one picture, The Ravine. It's also taken in the Second World War in the yeah. context of uh, Ukrainian collaboration mm -hmm. with, the, with the Germans. And she took one photograph and, and um, researched it uh, and, and, and did a whole, whole book on it. Now we, will, we, will have, we will see Wendy Lower next year in a Simon Wiesenthal lecture. Is there... Sorry? Lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> she said so. <laughs> she, she promised. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, is there, we have time for one last question of the audience. If, if there is one hand going in the air right now, I will take it. If not, 
then I would like to thank you very much for coming and staying with us in this weather. We are very happy to see a full, full um, um, audience here, um, which, which we were hoping for. And this is not, at least, I would say, also a result of the brilliant cooperation with the French institutions here in Vienna, which I want again to thank very much also for coming here and to being with us and to supporting Thomas and his brilliant talk. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. And um, yeah, see you next time. Spread the word. Thank you.